Hello, Vinny. Thank you so much for being here on The Makeup Historian. I'm super excited to have you on the show because we teach together at Cypress College, but in a moment here, I'm going to give you a second to introduce yourself to everyone listening. But just to recap for those listening to The Makeup Historian for the first time, the scope of the show or the objective is to preserve the beauty and blemishes of history. So I have asked Vinny here with me to talk a little bit about the beauty and blemishes of California history. And well, we'll get to our central question here in just a minute, but Vinny, thank you for being here. And would you mind telling us a little bit about your academic background and how you stumbled across teaching California history? Yeah, so my, my academic background's a little, a little muddy, we'll say. <laughs> Right. So I was a community college student. I went, uh, I, I went to a university at a place called Robert Morris University. It's right outside of Pittsburgh. So I was there and I graduated in, I don't even know the year. I think it's 05. <laughs> I don't want to date myself, but he graduated. And then I got in the hospitality industry for quite some time. Oh, and I, I was doing that. that. Yeah. And, and I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. And I wanted to, I always wanted to be a historian. That was always my dream was to be a community college professor, you know, like uh, reach for the stars. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so when I came back, I, I lived in Canada for a while and I came back uh, to California and I decided to go to graduate school with my terrible undergrad grades. And <laughs> Uh, weaseled my way into uh, a graduate program. Um, I graduated. And while I was doing that, it took me two and a half years to to finish everything about three years. And during that time, I, I worked a lot of nighttime. Um, and I was working four days a week, sometimes three days a week. And so I said, hey, I got all this extra time. And I decided I'm going to try an in an internship because I never really I had internships and they were you know that exciting and it wasn't what I really wanted to do and so I got a couple of uh volunteer internships and uh, one of them was at the Hart Museum oh, in Newhall cool. California the the house of William S Hart that he donated to the county of Los Angeles yeah. so I was there for three years I did a research project on an artist named Charles Cristodoro interesting fellow who worked for Walt Disney he was a private artist for Disney created oh, some cool. of the a lot of the character models for Pinocchio and Fantasia and he was at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago when he was 12 and then he was at the uh, Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco and the Panama California and San Diego and he he was his best friend did all the artwork inside of Groman's Chinese Theater and the, in the Catalina Casino, oh uh, that theater there too. And they were all connected to each other. And uh, I and he, I found out that he died literally five blocks away from where I grew up. So it was <laughs> like all of these very strange interactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got really into California history at that time. Um, and then uh, at the same time, I was working at the Simon Wiesenthal Center Archives, uh, doing work there, not knowing what I was doing, but they, they let me stay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I was at the, the Hart Museum, I really started to get into California history. And then I took a course on the U.S. West uh, at Cal State Northridge with a professor, my favorite professor, Josh Sides. He has I read a couple of his books and I thought they were really interesting. So I said, wouldn't it be cool if I took a course with them? So I took a course and it was a lot of fun. And he introduced me to the Mexican period of California, although it was somewhat brief there. I think he extended his teaching on the subject because the, da the, the daughter-in-law of Leonard Pitt was in the class. And at the time I didn't know who Leonard Pitt was. If, but once you get into California history, you realize Leonard Pitt wrote Decline of the Californios. That was one of the first books I read. And then it got me down the rabbit hole. I read Bill Deverell's book. And as books came out, I started to dig in and really get into California history. Uh, so I kind of had these, this dual focus of the American West 
along with Hollywood and then early colonial America. So I, over the course of about a good six, seven years, as I was working in hospitality, I, I was reading all of these books and gaining all of this knowledge and listening, got into podcasts and all of this. And it was really interesting to me. And then one day I decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a professor. So I emailed everybody and their mother (laughs) and they let me work. (laughs) And so, yeah, so I ended up in uh, working at first three community colleges, then it turned into six. And then I was an instructional designer and then I got a full-time job. So here I am kind of the roundabout way, (laughs) the long of the short, Um, but that's how it happened. And it's a, it's a, it was an interesting pathway compared to a lot of other people I talked to who, you know, go from high school to college, undergrad, then graduate school, then a PhD and they, they get out and it's like, okay, I kind of did everything backwards, which I usually do, right? So I personally love that because my academic journey does not make any sense. So that was super fun to learn about you. I didn't know that that was kind of your your story and how you found this topic that you love so much. Um, we'll have to, maybe you can share with us too. Like you said, you kind of maneuvered your way into grad school. I kind of did the same thing. So I don't know if you want to share, but I'm curious how you did that. And then I'll share how I did it. If you want. <laughs> but- oh, I just, I just called them. I called oh, okay. the department chair. <laughs> well, that's and they a good said, way can to I go take a course? <laughs> yeah. He goes, there's no way. And then uh, I took a course with them and he goes, yeah, you're fine. You oh, can take, wow. you can enroll. And then I was like, okay, cool. And then I did that. And I was telling a couple of my students who went to Berkeley and USC and all these super schools. And they're like, oh yeah, I kept all my letters. Did you keep all your letters? And I said, I never got a letter. (laughs) (laughs) It was all right. Go in, you're going through the back door and uh, don't make too much noise in there. So yeah, that's, that's how I did it. And, you know, sometimes having a, you know, uh, not being shy and, or embarrassed, you know, at that point I had done very well for myself. So I wasn't like, it wasn't going to break my heart if I wasn't good at this. I just really wanted to do it. (laughs) So I did it and, and it worked and, you know, thank God. Um, It's been a lot of fun. How about yourself? How did you, how did you break into this scam? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I wish my story was like that. Um, I was a little bit of a smart aleck, if you will, and didn't get the bright idea to go to grad school until the very last second. So like during undergrad, you know, I didn't do any of the things that you should do if you're going to apply for grad school. And then the very last semester, I was like, I think I really want to do this. I think I want to be a professor, but I kind of need that master's. So then I put together this application and everything was great, except my GPA, because I was working full time when I was earning my bachelor. So My GPA wasn't great and I uh, didn't get accepted the first time that I asked, but I didn't, I wasn't ready to take no for an answer. So I reached out uh, to the graduate advisor and basically like kept emailing him until he would have a meeting with me. And pretty much the outcome of that meeting was I asked for a chance. You know, I was like, my GPA is not a reflection of my intelligence. Can I please just have a chance to prove to you that I can handle graduate level courses? And he was like, yeah, we can do that. You go through open enrollment. And then if you're able to pass, then I'll admit you into the graduate program. So kind of in a sense, it's, it, uh, you know, similar to your story in in regards of like, I think you have to ask for what you want in life and not be afraid to ask for that, even when the path isn't exactly um, traditional. (laughs) But, you know, and it all worked out because now we're both professors. (laughs) Yeah. And I, it's one of those things. It it doesn't matter how you got there, you got there, you know, and exactly. Yep. And I even told I mean, my would it, it would be great to have a letter though, right? Of acceptance. <laughs> it would that be would great. Be nice. <laughs> but whatever. That um, would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. That's that's amazing. I loved learning about that. So I really wanted to tackle two things with our conversation today. The first being 
things that we probably really should know about California history. And we'll talk a little bit about why there's so much that we don't know. And then the second part of our conversation, I wanna tackle you know, what it really has been like to be a professor during the pandemic of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Because as, as you mentioned a moment ago, you had a chance to listen to the conversation I had with Bustos who was on the show. And I think, you know, it's so important for us to document what teachers are going through during this experience. And I, you and I both know that with oral history interviews, the historians themselves, most of the time their voice is not preserved. So that's what I would like the second half of our interview to be. But let's get to the California history part. So I'm just gonna throw the broad <laughs> question at you and we'll see where you go with it. We'll just kind of play this by ear, but what are some of the main things that you think uh, we probably should know about California history? With California history, uh, knowing, I guess the question was, right, that um, what do we need to know about California history? And there are a lot of very important things that happen that affect a lot of what's going on, particularly for Mexican Americans during the Mexican War period, the Treaty of Cuenca, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Those things are very important. But also, I think the California missions is very important uh, in the sense that how things were laid down economically, uh, some of the things that become big industries in California. One thing, I mean, you don't think of the missions as the, the beginning of the wine industry in California or the citrus industry, oranges, first grown at the San Gabriel mission uh, and, and the San Diego missions and brought there from Baja, California. Those things seem not so big when you're thinking about them during the mission period, but they become major aspects of California industry in the early 20th century, late 19th century, that draw people from all over the country to come to California as a place of healing, a place of wellness, but also as a place that can be marketed to individuals, not only the great weather, uh, the, the citrus industry, for example, it's much easier to walk about your grove and and trim your trees than it is to be plowing uh, in the middle of Missouri or Nebraska somewhere. So it becomes part of what California is. Other things like the church bringing the palm tree to California, that's not an indigenous plant. So the missions are responsible for that as well. Why Palm Sunday? You need it for Catholic church uh, for mass. Um, and so those types of things develop in California, or you see palm trees, or you uh, see some of the old orange ads uh, for some of the distributors and stuff in, in Orange County and Riverside County. And it's where did those things come from? They started with the California missions. Mm -hmm. And that, so I think that's a very important aspect of California that's not really taught. And as we were discussing earlier, one of the things about California history is that it's it doesn't fit perfectly into any other history except California history, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, prior to 1821, it's part of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish Empire is gigantic. New Spain and Latin America are having all kinds of issues that are much larger in scale than what is going on in California. And California is a blip on the radar. So it doesn't fit in there. It doesn't It fits maybe in the Latin American history and as far as trade routes, but it's nominal. They're kind of an afterthought. And then you come into the Mexican period and California is only part of Mexican history from 1821 to 1848. And during most of that period, they are also an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And so they don't fit into Mexican history. And then you go into the uh, American history. And I've been in courses. Uh, like with David Igler, where they talk about the missions and the colonial period. That's an early American course. That's a graduate course, though. Mm -hmm. So as far as like a, just a normal undergraduate course, it may fit in with colonization, but then you're missing the entire period that leads up to the Mexican War, and there's no context there. Yeah. So it's very hard to understand where these people come from. The really American history in California starts with the gold rush. 
and that that's the captivating narrative it's the the pinnacle of manifest destiny and it it works as part of that chronological history in the textbooks they give us right so yeah. so that's the problem with california history and also it's a very violent place uh, especially in the 19th century and before and where it fits with common core standards is in fourth grade. <laughs> yeah. So my have uh, uh, my son is in third grade, and you know we talk history, but there's limitations to that, right? You can't talk about mass killings of Native Americans. You can't talk about uh, in great detail of, of lynchings of black, white. Uh, indigenous people. You can't talk about the slave markets of downtown Los Angeles where Native American labor was exploited. You can't talk about those things, right? And so it becomes kind of this lost subject. And some of us get to college. And, it, and then again, it depends on who your professor is then. If your professor is really into the 20th century, which lots of historians are, you miss out on the, on the, on the 18th and 19th centuries as being part important parts of California's history. And so there's a lot that's missed, especially in, in that early period, because, you know, lots of historians categorize it as they're these medieval kind of throwbacks of, of human civilization living in California and big bad Americans come and exploit them and everybody exploits everybody and we have a new state. So, <laughs> yeah. So lots of lots of things that kind of fall through the cracks in terms of curriculum, and and that's very hard, right? Um, I had one student who was Hawaiian, and she told me, "Why why don't you do this in high school? In Hawaii, it's eleventh grade requirement to learn your state's history, and that's where it'd be more appropriate, and yeah. that's where you can dig in, and you don't have to make those stupid missions out of." cardboard or foam or whatever you make them out of that you get the kid at Michael's or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really love how you explain that because even like we were talking before about our own experiences and when we were exposed to California history and the education system. And like for me, it was, you know, fourth grade and then it wasn't until graduate school that I had another opportunity to learn about California history. And that's such a gap. And then we both grew up in California. It wasn't a requirement for us in high school or didn't talk about it in middle school. So that's, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. And then on top of that, it's kind of like you were saying, it, it, different parts of California history just get put into other different types of um, survey history textbooks. And it's very rare that we have a good survey of California history, all of it, and to not have it be so uh, rigid with like the chronological structure. So, you know, and, and that kind of breaks my heart, especially now having to learn more about it, um, having to teach it, which is really sad too, that like, I didn't really start refreshing on California history until I had to teach it. And that that's kind of sad. I don't think that should happen for people who grow up in California. So it, and maybe narrowing in a little bit more on the early part of California history, because I think that's what most people, probably it's a little bit fuzzy. What do you think are some of like the, like a, a main event that more people should know about in regards to early California history? Well, of course, the missions, that's standard, but I, I like to focus on the people of California because they are interesting for their good and bad qualities. Mm -hmm. And you go through California and you see Figueroa. Figueroa, that's Staples Center, right? That's downtown. Mm -hmm. But Figueroa was a Mexican governor. Or you see Pico Boulevard, like who, who are these people? Or you go uh, Cabrillo, uh, the Cabrillo Monument, that's Spanish and that's 1542 or whatever it is. And you, you know, you, you see um, all these different names throughout the state. You can go all the way up and they're all Spanish names and nobody knows who they are. Yeah. So for example, one of, the, one of the governors of Alta California, Juan Bautista Alvarado, they forgot where his grave was. <laughs> they had to, <laughs> I, you know, I went up there and I saw the adobe and they told me the story that they bought him a new headstone because 
they lost his other one. So no way. They where he was buried. And so, like, this oh. is literally <laughs> forgotten history. Wow. They're forgotten people. And when you lose a lot of that, you lose who they were. And it's kind of just like a quick processing processing uh, to get to the next to the next event in American history. It's always kind of a sidestep. Or, like, for example, Augustine Olvera, uh, Olvera Street. You, know, you can go to Olvera Street and, wow, this is really cool. And that is a part of that time period. And so all of these things, Sepulveda, uh, all, all these different things and names uh, and places are right here. Right? Like mm -hmm. the missions, you can go to a mission. You could learn about Gettysburg. You can learn about uh, the, the French and Indian War and all that happened on the other side. Yeah. But here we can talk about it and then you can drive by it and see, oh, now I know what Presidio means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is a Presidio? Yeah. So now I know. <laughs> you know about California history and then you visit and you see all these different places and how it remains a military uh, place, uh, specifically in San Francisco, right? The, the, the Presidio of San Francisco. And that's, it, it remains part of California's history and all of that is really forgotten and nobody knows about it. And so I think it's a little bit of a disservice to not teach this as an upper division. I think everybody in the state should know their history, right? Not just the, the in and out started in California. Awesome. <laughs> and that's what people know. People know about those things or McDonald's and San Bernardino. Yeah, that's really cool. But those things are very well known. It's the things that you see every day. You go to these places and you see the Pico House in downtown. They're like, oh, that's kind of a cool building. First luxury hotel in Los Angeles. City wasn't ready for it, went out of business. <laughs> right? They sold Mission San Fernando. Andreas Pico sold Mission San Fernando so they can get enough money to get that, make that hotel. And they lost. Right? Oh. <laughs> One of the losing bets. Um, and so there's a lot of these interesting places that are very attainable, like the old uh indian trails uh, behind l where i live the, there's petroglyphs there's all these places literally within a mile away and nobody knows they're there right overgrown with weeds sometimes and people just kind of shrug their shoulder and say yeah yeah that's that's that but nobody knows about it and yeah i find that my california history course is popular because of that it's not because of me it's because you start to see all the different places that are right at your fingertips. And so yeah. it's, it becomes really interesting and really cool. Um, mm -hmm. Or that, you know, it's little things like Teddy Roosevelt was, was at the Natural History Museum and there's video of him in San Diego at the opening of Balboa Park. And it's, wow, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, you know who that is, but you never connect him with being in California. Why was he popular in California? Because he was out here and glad handing and part of all these big huge events at the turn of the 20th century that make him a big historical figure um in california uh so yeah I, th I think we could probably do a better job of incorporating california's history into upper division curriculum i think it should be a requirement for everybody yeah um you know and there's been laws and uh, legislation that's passed about the ethnic studies thing well california history has everybody everybody there were people coming from all over the world to the gold rush unlike any other place the first melting pot in the united states was san francisco with the mm -hmm. gold rush the true melting pot where you have chinese and uh japanese and peruvians and mexicans americans bostonians englishmen and all of these people are writing down their experience. Yeah. And it gives you an idea of what America, the struggle of America and how violent it was. And I don't think that story is captured so much in revolutionary America as much, right? Yeah. The literacy is higher. People who are coming here are writing, they're expressing themselves. They're writing postcards and letters to move, to sending things back home. So we have, an abundant amount of material in the most diverse place, probably in the world at that point in time. 
Probably. I agree with that. Yeah. You, may, you may be able to make that argument. You know, the Hawaiians here, you you name it. Somebody was here. <laughs> yeah. I wish, I, I, I really love that that's how you're teaching California history. When you think about it from like the, how are these structural decisions really impacting the everyday realities for, for people? I think it just completely brings the topic to life. And I mean, honestly, if mo I think like what we, this is, I get why we do this, but I wish more people taught it kind of like how you are teaching it. Most of the time when we interject California history into wh whatever history course it is, uh, we think about it in, in the sense of like it becoming an economic powerhouse after, you know, really with World War One and then with wor World War II, how it's set up and how um, it just like our economy flourishes. And then that's kind of where the conversation stops. But then maybe, I don't know, do you think maybe because in regards to like the everyday realities, there is an element of California history that is kind of like that R-rated version. Do you think maybe that's contributing to why we don't really talk about it too much or interject it as much in different history classes? You know, I don't know. I think it's, I think if more people knew about it, it would probably be more popular just mm -hmm. because it is the Wild West. It is the place where dreams are made and broken yeah and and that that is the american story i think um, mm -hmm. for for a lot of people and a lot of different people of different backgrounds trying to figure it out you know uh, civil rights in california is another big topic people don't think of california as being part of the civil rights movement but it certainly was mm -hmm. there's not just amazing yeah. things like amazing businesses amazing movements that originate in california and i honestly was kind of almost embarrassed that i didn't really know how much happened in my own state until i until really when i had to start teaching the course and that's you know so maybe what do you think there are things that maybe we could do to help like i'm, I'm trying to think of like how do we go about fixing this in a sense of helping more people learn about California history earlier or in a different, like, are we not presenting the information in a kind of, now I'm thinking more like the, now I'm going to tap into your instructional design <laughs> mindset, <laughs> but like, yeah, how I do don't, you go about I, teaching it better? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know that much. I just, I'm just kind of going with the flow. <laughs> but I, yeah, I mean, if it's one of the one of the things is if it doesn't catch you at some point, right? It, or it cut in Professor Sides's course, it caught me there. It caught me, and I was at the heart. There were all kinds of other California things, aviation, oil, all of that's up there in the Santa Clarita Valley, and so mm -hmm. that's captivating. But if if it doesn't capture you, it's really hard to I feel to go back and learn it. Like, I feel like that's the hard way to do history because you don't have like a base foundation of knowledge right, yeah. that you do of U.S. history or even the Egyptians or the, the Romans. I mean, a lot more people know about that in our state than they do about all the events that happened in California at different times, uh, different different areas of the state. So no and you you bring up a good point that it's kind of it's more difficult to go backwards that's a, a definitely a challenge from a marketing standpoint but i'm thinking too like i know that there's a push in california to have more financial literacy classes and i think maybe even incorporating a, an aspect of california history in a financial class for california uh, high school students or maybe even like for for undergrad I think that would be a really fascinating way to interject the story earlier, maybe catch more people, because there is so much that, like, a California really does emerge as one of those economic powerhouses, like, like, and it's not even comparable to any other state. And then on top of that, there's all of the cultural diversity that you were talking about, too. It's like when people learn about it, when they're actually exposed to it, usually they fall in love with it. It's a really interesting rich dynamic history but it's just like wow we really don't 
present it? And I'm, I, and I'm not saying either of us have the answer, but I'm just kind of curious, like that kind of almost makes me sad that this is something that's happening, a, a glitch, if you will, <laughs> in our economic, or I'm sorry, educational system here in California. But who knows, yeah. Maybe that's something for future scholars to yeah, help us with. <laughs> Maybe it'll become fashionable, like some, uh, it seems like a lot of these courses, I was thinking about it the other day, a lot of the courses I took as a community college student, it's World War II, Vietnam. Yeah. A lot of a lot of those courses, uh, you know, world conflict, and it's all like World War I, World War II. But then you think about it, and it's like, okay, the people who were teaching me were probably... I don't know, maybe a few years removed uh, from World War II, World War I, the Vietnam, all of those things had much more meaning, I think, than today's generation. So it's a reflection of the historians. And I think the movement towards the racial identities and the wrestling with our past and all of that is fashionable today. Uh, I don't want, I don't know if the term is fashionable, but you know, <laughs> it's it's much more present. And I think in, in, as we move forward, the American West, California will all start to become more important to maybe younger historians. Maybe mm -hmm. we're the first, we're the tip of the iceberg here. And there'll be a lot more uh, than, you know, there are many amazing California historians, but I don't think there are enough to go around. Uh, yeah. There are, not every graduate program has two or three, you know, as you would in ancient history or like the U.S. history. Um, so if there are more people studying it, it it's it'll 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 grow hopefully. Um, but I don't know. I guess that remains to be seen. And there's the big historians that everybody knows: the Stephen Hackles, David Iglers, yeah. uh, Benjamin Madleys. Uh, uh, I'll even throw in Brian DeLay, who's at Berkeley, and he wrote a book about the West and the Comanche and all of that. But all of those, all of those people are making contributions. But I think a lot more can, and in different ways. I think there are more stories in California that are left unsaid that can easily have the potential to uh, do a podcast or anything like that, but movies and television shows and those things will start to tap more into uh the american consci consciousness uh more broadly and hopefully see a little bit more yeah and as as you were talking this is a, a little bit off of our off topic for our discussion but i am kind of curious like from an uh, instructional mindset like for women's history it's like the women's history classes that I teach, it was actually really difficult to find a survey a textbook of women's history. And it's it's pretty recent, actually. Like we don't start getting true surveys of women's history in America until like the 70s, really. So, and, and then I noticed that too with the California survey history textbooks for the college level, I'm, I'm wondering like, is it because they're actually just too new? that like this isn't really a common thing or have they been around a little bit longer and I just don't know about it? Or are the survey history textbooks for California, are, are, are they like adequate? Do we need to revise them or add to them or change things? I'm not as familiar with them from like an editorial standpoint. Yeah, I think they're great. Okay, good. <laughs> they have like a Lucid Eden. Um, my favorite is uh, the Walton Bean text. That's the one I used as a community college student. Uh, okay. There, there are quite a few different ones and different perspectives. And there, I think a lot of this really probably started in the 1930s. I think there was an idea like the mission revival and all of that into mm -hmm. the 1950s. And that's the era of Walton Bean. Then you have the 60s and California is a hotbed of civil rights. And you have those ideas being discussed and then injected into books like Leonard, Leonard Pitt's uh, decline of the Californias. But they're, the textbooks are pretty extensive compared to even a US history textbook because I don't know why. They're just like broken <laughs> into smaller chapters. Like a, a lot of the books will have like 30 chapters, 35 chapters, whereas, you know, a US history textbook, uh, one or two will have 15 
chapters, 16 chapters. Yeah. And so that was uh, initially a, a, a challenge for me because it's like, okay, if I go through this entire book, the first time I ever taught the course, I'm like, how do I, <laughs> how do I teach this? Because I do I do two chapters a week? Like, how does this yeah. work? And so that's when I really started to piecemeal stuff uh, and start to go, okay, I can talk about this and, but what primary sources go with this or what videos that are out there go with this and start to pair stuff up and trend more in the, uh, the OER open educational resource direction. And, and that got me moving that way too. And so it's really what you want to make of it, I guess. And that's the way I kind of approached it instead of just relying on a textbook. And and it was much more fun that way, right? So I can do, okay, we're going to put the, we're going to create this box. This box will be about early and native California. And then the next one is going to be the sacred expedition and the missions. And then we're going to talk about politics. And then we're going to talk about the the Mexican war, then the gold rush. And, And so I started to put things into boxes instead of kind of, trying to move through things faster to get to the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And then I started ending my course at, a, at the civil rights in the 1960s, late 1960s. So, um, and, and that way you cover a lot of the things, but you can get into more of the nuanced detail of a single topic. Uh, I think it was, I saw Jessica Kim, she's a professor at, at Cal State Northridge. And she said uh, in, at, the con- at one of the conferences I was at that, she does five things, and that stuck in my mind. I was like, dang, that's so smart. <laughs> so in a U.S. survey, she'll do five things. And so I took that approach, and I'm like, well, then I'll do eight topics in California history, and I could always change them every semester. So every course is a little bit different. Okay. And then it bled into my U.S. history courses, and then all my courses are like that now. So okay. I'll pick eight top topics that I really did. And then I'll dig in and, and then we go into more nuanced detail because you can't do everything. Um, and, and it makes it more fun because then, you know, you're always looking for new stuff and you use the book the textbooks more as like a reference than, a, than an actual textbook. And I think it captures student attention a little bit better because you get into the personalities and the people. It's not just a, a running fact sheet it starts to become more personal. And I, that's what I enjoy about California. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. No, and I I haven't used that approach yet in one of my classes, but I, I really want to try it, especially for like women's history, because I feel like we have a similar um, objectives that we're trying to achieve. And I really like that approach. I haven't heard about that really so this is why I like talking to other educators because as an adjunct I'm kind of on an island all by myself most of the time so I appreciate you telling me your teaching strategies (laughs) yeah I I I just tried as whatever I could because I knew nothing (laughs) and then and then and now five years later I've taught about a hundred courses because I was teaching a lot of courses there for a while Mm -hmm. I always go back once a year at least and go back to the drawing board and start everything over from scratch and see what else I can make. And and, and that's, that keeps it fresh, you know, Mm -hmm. see a book. Yeah. yeah. Very antsy with my, my teaching. I'm always like, I didn't like that. I want to try this next semester. And I'm always trying to figure, I feel like I haven't quite found my particular like rhythm or, or, you know, style with teaching. Like I'm, I like testing out new things all the time and incorporating new technology into classes and new primary sources. And so, yeah, no, I like that approach. Definitely. Yeah. It's worked for me, especially in some of the, where there are a lot of different topics, it makes it easier if you break it down into the, into smaller batch, you know, don't get, get crazy with trying to cover, you know, an ancient world course you're covering, I don't know, 60,000 years, maybe 100,000, maybe more years of yeah, history. So <laughs> you can't cover everything then. And that really, that, you know, that'll change the way you think about things. Because <laughs> yeah. you're like, well, you know, I remember the first time I taught an ancient world course, I was, uh, I almost lost my mind because I'm like, how can anybody be an expert in all of these different things? There's too much. 
and uh, I, I changed my approach and I was much happier uh, because you can't know everything. You can't, you can't be an expert in everything. So things started to change on how I taught in the, in the, in the classroom. And I saw the work of some other people and the historical thinking thing started to come into play. And, mm -hmm. and, and that became more of the objective that can be applied to any course. Uh, instead of just, you know, this course is like this and this course is like that. If you can create a structure for yourself, it, it saves your life, <laughs> especially when you have no <laughs> clue what you're doing and you're freeway flying, you're going to six different places and hoping you get there on time. I mean, you don't have a lot of time to create a new content. And yeah. so it better be good and it better be fast. Yeah. You know? Yep. <laughs> It is quite the challenge to uh, teach a new class for the first time. It's, yeah, it's always, always interesting. New challenges every day, every week. <laughs> yeah, and I always said yes, always. Okay. Yeah. Even, yeah, even though a lot of times I went in there and I was like, what am I doing? Why did I say yes? What did I do? Uh, but literally that's exactly how I felt when I was like yeah I'll teach California history and then I was like oh my goodness this is a totally different ball game <laughs> and I need to yeah. brush up and re-strategize and but and, but it's actually it's a good thing though because after teaching this class now I'm kind of like wait I want to I want to look more into this now and you know kind of like I can see all the different ways that I can improve that class and, and continue and develop things and so I like that mindset and I, I tend to do the same thing, you know, always say yes to teaching a new class, but that's mostly just because of the money <laughs> at this stage in my life. <laughs> yeah, that works too. That always yeah, is helps. helpful. <laughs> so I've heard you talk about the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe a few times, I believe. Treaty or of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the, yes. uh, the preceding Treaty of Cahuenga. Yeah, I didn't know which one you wanted to tackle first, but I've heard you talk about them a few times and I always like what you have to say about them. So I definitely yeah. can't resist the opportunity to ask you to talk about them in the in a podcast interview. <laughs> well, that's that's a thing that nobody knows about. Even and I didn't even know much about it. And you know, when you do more research on the Treaty of Cahuenga, the Treaty of Cahuenga essentially meant that the Californios gave up, <laughs> but they, but they, but they got, they got some stuff in the deal. And a, a lot of that ends up in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is one of the most important treaties in American history because it allows the first, for the first time uh, on the, in federal elections, minorities to vote, but not only to vote, but also run for office. Yeah. And that's, massive and the I, fact that I, we don't talk about that is like what i'm i was like what? yeah it, when i first learned about it and started digging deeper and it's both of the treaties are so interesting the the cat and the mouse game to get to the treaty of Cahuenga and then to gain citizenship and to get land rights at least on paper this is a monumental task when you consider that the United States Army, compared to forces in California, they they were cooked from the beginning. And it's amazing that they survived long enough to, and, and were uh, savvy enough to get these things on paper. Now, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo it goes through, and it's a it's a it's a big deal. But even as a lot of those things are not actually you know, living up, the, um, the United States doesn't live up to a lot of those promises. It still is a historical moment where the needle moves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important that people know about it. It's, people forgot about it. And like I was saying earlier, um, in California, we forgot about it. I mean, the site of the Treaty of Cahuenga was gone. Nobody knew where it was. And when they were building the metro, they found the foundation oh. of the Tomas Feliz Adobe and boom, there it is. Historical archaeology right in downtown or, you know, right in up Coenga. And um, 
<laughs> it's like, how do you, how do you forget that, that place, you know? Wow. How do you forget that? Because that is, for, the, for Mexicans, uh, Mexican-Americans, that's the, mo that's the birth of Mexican-Americans in California. Yeah. It's pretty awesome, if you think about it, right? We yes. have, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation for African-Americans, Bradley, is, that's the point. That's the big, that's, that's a big deal. Or uh, some of the amendments of the constitution for African-Americans, other, others, those, that's a big deal in their history. And then this, for one of the larger populations, Hispanics in the United States, yeah. the birth of that in California was forgotten, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, there's a lot to be done there. There's a lot that we can explore and talk about. And a lot of these things are on display. For example, they have the story of Los Angeles at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. And one of the items is the desk. Andreas Pico signed the capitulation to John C. Fremont. And it's there in the museum. And it's like, who thought to keep that? But we forgot where the adobe was. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> but it's amazing that they kept that. Or somebody yeah. thought ahead enough that this is a historic desk like it's a desk it's yeah. just you wouldn't know what it was um and that was exciting for me to see that or some of the things that are in that collection at the Seaver Center if you ever research in California the Seaver Center is great they have a great archive cool stuff in there um it is to me the archive of Los Angeles uh, my favorite because you know lots of the documents and communications uh, the 19th century, and of course the Huntington too. But you know, for me, uh, being a Mexican American historian, they have a lot of the Pico stuff and some of the yeah. other family, and it's just really interesting that it's all there. You mm -hmm. know, Andreas Pico, who signed the capitulation, they have some of his some of his suits in their collection. Yeah, it's like wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> you know. I, and you bring up a good point, like I, the Seaver Center has a special place in my heart because that was the first archival experience I ever had as an undergrad. And I was just like, oh, this is the coolest thing. Kind of felt like borderline Indiana Jones. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. And I wish more, like you said, I wish more people knew about it because there's so much there. And like the last time I was there though, they, they don't have a lot digitized or maybe they do now but it's just not the same thing like any any historian or history major or history student listening like you got to go to the Sievers Sieber Center it's amazing <laughs> yeah and, and they used to have a California exhibit in the basement uh where the because yeah, the Sieber Center is actually in the basement yeah and it was they didn't have any of those things they had like these models of the California missions it's like <laughs> in retrospect I'm kind of like who cares man where was where was this desk? You had this desk the whole time. You had the, right. you know, you had <laughs> yeah, Pio Pico's yeah. rosary and you, you were holding out on us. What else you got back there? Which, yeah, I took a tour of that of, of that archive too when I was at, uh, I took a course at Northridge on uh, the archival studies course or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, that was an interesting field trip to see all the stuff they have in there. And you're just like, whoa, they don't, they're not even showing half their cards here. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. Oh, lots of really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. No. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, I wish more people knew about both of those because, like you said, it's so it's it's not only important to American history, but so it's like one of the major, like top moments, beautiful moments of California history that I think we do need to bring a lot more attention to. And it is kind of ironic that we don't bring it into conversation when there's all of this. You know, there's such a push for diversity in academia, which I'm all for, but like things like that, I'm like that's, I feel like that's kind of like the epitome of that narrative and we're not talking about it. <laughs> like, why aren't we talking about it or bringing more attention to it? So thank you for, for sharing that with us. Yeah. And I, I even, I even emailed my state Senator and he never got back to me. So. Oh, really? <laughs> it's like, we should make this a requirement. <laughs> never got back to, never got back to me but anyway well i have I see where I stand. opinions about politicians but i'll i I'll tried <laughs> that would be a good idea yeah but it, but it is an interesting it is an interesting time 
multiple times, multiple places, multiple different types of people and different experiences. It's just a, you know, and everybody's family who's, who's come to California, it's probably an interesting story too. You know, my family yeah. came during the depression and they ended up, they ended up here. My, my, uh, my Anglo side. <laughs> and then my, uh, you know, my, my Mexican grandparents, they came here uh, during the Mexican revolution. Like that was a big deal. You know, a lot of people did. Another part of my family came here uh, from Arizona um, in the mining industry. So it's, everybody's moving here for something and it's always for a better opportunity. And, and I think that that's really cool. That's, I love that part about California. You know, you can't, you, you get this, everybody's always searching for something better in California, it seems like. Yeah. And there's also just like that, that grittiness to the work ethic of, of California history. I love that. Like the, the more I dive into California history, I'm just like, wow, there's such a, an American like grit there. And I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's all kinds of stories. There's to the from the refined to the wild, right? It's all it's all here and movies and of course then the politics and there's so much. And I, I think, you know, it I think it will catch on a little more, especially moving forward. Yeah. I think people are more interested in what goes on in California than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. And especially as you keep teaching more amazing California history classes. <laughs> ah, I wouldn't go that far, but I try. You know. <laughs> well, I definitely want to get your insight on this. We'll kind of transition to the second part of, or the second main question for our interview. Um, but I'm very curious to get your insight on, as, a, as an instructor, what do you want future generations to really remember about what it was like to be a professor during the COVID-19 pandemic, which I know is a very, very broad question. Yeah. Tackle it any way that you please, but I, you know, I can't, like, we got to preserve that. <laughs> I just yeah. know someone 10, 50, 100 years from now is going to like, that's going to be a dissertation topic. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, for me, it was interesting because I had become very interested in instructional design and distance education before okay. the pandemic, about a year and a half before. And I was having a lot of fun with a lot of it. I was like, this is the future, completely accessible anytime, any place, anywhere. Yeah. And I thought online education allowed people who normally wouldn't have the opportunity to get a degree was it as good a quality? And I always thought, well, I can make it as good a quality if I had the time and the the equipment. And and so all those ideas brewed for about a year and a half before the pandemic. Okay. And when the pandemic struck, I said, this is it. <laughs> it's my chance. <laughs> so I, was, I was almost like a doomsday prepper. <laughs> and doomsday actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm ready. And so it was, at first it was really strange. It was really awkward because you went from a, being in a very personal environment. And I think I was teaching 11 courses when we fell into the pandemic. 11? Yeah. I was oh running buck wild. Whoa. Or maybe it was 10 and then I got an eight week after the pandemic started. <laughs> but anyway, there, it was a lot of classes. and. Um, the hardest part for me was that it went from being a very personal environment to a very impersonal environment. Yeah. And that was really hard for me because I like to joke around. I like to have fun. And in an online environment, you realize, oh, this is what is missing. Mm -hmm. It's the personality and the personal. Like, hey, what are your interests? Hey, what'd you do this weekend? Hey, you know, and those things can be incorporated into the curriculum, especially in California history, Mexican American history, a lot of the courses I've taught. And that was gone. 
Yeah. They still haven't quite figured out a way to recapture that yet. That personal environment in an online ecosystem. Mm. But it changed the way I taught everything or the way I looked at everything. I became much less rigid. And I think everybody had to become much less rigid because if certainly if you weren't capable, Mm -hmm. if you weren't very tech savvy, you certainly had to be very flexible to save face. I I know a lot of instructors had to save face because they had no idea. (laughs) And even those who were involved and into it had no idea. Like, okay, I was teaching three classes online when the pandemic hit and now you got 11. That's completely different. That's Mm -hmm. completely different. And then you're trying to, are we doing asynchronous and uh, or synchronous or what's going on? What are the rules with the cameras on, cameras off? Yeah. All of those things were really confusing. And at the time, I was working at four or five different campuses, four or five, something like that. And everybody had different rules. And so it was a nightmare in, in that regard because it's like in, at this campus, we want you to be synchro- uh, asynchronous to allow um, uh, people – the opportunity to go work during the pandemic and make money and be essential workers because at some campuses I had students go, Hey man, (laughs) they're paying this much money at this local market. I'm going to go get it. And what do you say to somebody who's trying to survive? Yeah. Say I'll record it for you. Well then, you know, that changes everything. Now there's a bunch of other things that happen because of that. And there's this big butterfly effect. So you, so some were synchronous, some were asynchronous. Uh, some wanted uh, the cameras on. Some were saying cameras off for everybody. And all of a sudden they're in your living room, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or, you know, I would do lectures on the balcony and, you know, you know, it's it's a, just a different environment. Your neighbor's down there. At the time I was living uh, in, in an apartment and people were smoking while I'm like trying to like lecture and it's <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, you know, the first time you see a student drinking a beer, or smoking a cigarette on, on in the middle of class, like a, uh, it's like, Hey, oh uh, Hey man, I get it. <laughs> I get it. And so that was that was hard to adjust to all of those little things, especially not being at one campus. And everybody's trying to make these rules and regulations, and you, then you have students who are dealing with a lot, a lot of frustration, students who are very social, people who are very social, like myself. You can't go anywhere, you can't, and you're just trapped. And how do you learn in that environment? Well, you, you got to try your best, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, it forced me to become more flexible. It forced me to say, yeah, is that really that important? Yeah, no, not really. Not so much anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And all of those things changed my outlook moving forward. Um, and I think some of it has been very beneficial overall this whole thing and some of it's been very detrimental Mm. because the rules change so many times now there are no rules (laughs) as before it was show up on time you know you miss three classes you're cut yeah You you can't measure it the same anymore and when you take away that structure in live classes in some ways that bleeds over into online classes and now all of a sudden everybody just wants to do whatever whenever and then you want to accommodate which I did you're like I'll just turn in anything whenever whatever just you know I understand it's hard times whatever and at the end of the semester I had like 450 submissions and I went oh what did I do to myself oh no you got seven days to turn the grades in you're like (laughs) oh man I was too nice <laughs> and so I spent an uh, unbelievable amount of hours, but it was it was interesting to 
kind of go with the flow. And it, it was good in another sense, too, because the hardest part for me was lecturing to nobody. Yes. That's get used to having <laughs> 50 people. You know, I, you know, I was teaching 10 classes, 10 classes every semester. And so I have 400 people a day looking at me, right? Or a 200, 200 people a day mm-hmm. asking me questions, making me think. Now it's just me. It's the trippiest experience. Like, it's oh, so no. Weird. <laughs> and then, no, I don't like my voice. I don't like, you know, the way I look. I'm not going to record my image. Okay. Oh, I stuttered. I really sound like that. I said that so many times or this so many times. Oh, I got to edit that out. And then, oh, it sounds choppy. And then a three hour lecture turns into, you know, 15 hours. <laughs> right. I did the same exact thing. It was such, in the beginning, it was such a production and yeah. trying to just adapt and get used to it. And like you said, it's like, yes, there, it made us really adaptable. I think it forced people who, you know, really wanted to stick with it they they evolved and and uh got out of their comfort zone but it was rough in the beginning now it's like i'm definitely more tech savvy and uh it's down to kind of like a formula but it was really tough there in the beginning and talking to yourself like as you're lecturing that was the weirdest experience in the beginning of covid i did not like that (laughs) it's like this is so trippy (laughs) don't like that at all <laughs> yeah or my neighbor like screaming or <laughs> my daughter house. crying it's like I, oh my exactly my dogs were always in the background like and yeah. I had to I was in the beginning of the pandemic I was watching my my dad has a little like well he's not little anymore but an English bulldog and I would watch him a lot in the beginning of the pandemic. So it would be like Roland snoring in the background of my lectures. And sometimes I would just be so tired. I'm like, oh, well, okay, they're snoring in this one. I don't know. I can't, I can't change anything about that. Like I'm stuck. <laughs> so then the first like semester when it was completely all online, those students got to know Roland very well because he was always in the lectures, but I got better at the audio down the road. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was very very interesting time, um, and and now I don't. Uh, it's just different in the classroom because both you and I teach in person. Yeah, this is our oh. first. This is my first semester back. I think it was the first one yeah. for you too, right? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. This has been an adjustment as well, like trying to yeah. go back into teaching in person, and all again, it's like all of these new policies and. Um, like there, I, I've experienced a huge, I feel like there's been a huge increase in mental health issues. And it's like, there's already logistic challenges in the classroom, but now on top of like, just trying to be mindful of every one's particular situation, it's doable, but it's very draining. I, I don't know if you've experienced that too this semester, but I've never been so tired as I am this semester trying to make that transition back in person. Yeah, that, that's been a little bit of a challenge because then you get so used to talking to nobody. Now you have people in front of you and you're like, whoa, whoa. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on this now, what happened? I so. felt so rusty, I still do. This semester I was, I was just like, okay, you have to be forgiving to yourself, Sarah, like just one day at a time. But I, like before the pandemic, I felt like I was like on the top of my game in regards to my lectures. And then like, boom, everything changed. And now I'm trying to figure out how to get that rhythm back. And like you said, it's just weird to now everyone's there again. Yeah, I I think it'll change once there are more people in person. Because like when I show up, I see you in the crossing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But that's it. You know, there's right? not. <laughs> We're the only two there in the morning. It's, it's very. It's like teaching at Chernobyl University. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like nobody's there. Kind of. Like used to be because you know, I, I remember the halls being flooded. I remember 
there not being a place to sit outside on any of the benches because there are so many people. Yeah. Now, it's like you're the last one to leave Disneyland, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that'll change. Hopefully that changes. That's I, I really hope that is something that we can get over and get back to because that was a lot of fun. Yeah. With getting yeah. to know people, right? Those, those, um, I, I like to call them micro interactions. Are you just like, hey, how's it going? Hey, you went to this restaurant? Cool. Bye. You just move <laughs> along. Right. There, there's none of that. And then I think people are a little, uh, I don't want to say uptight, but, you know, a little frustrated because they're, we don't get that every day, you know? Yeah students included, you know, um, and we're all just trying to adjust, but I think it'll change once we go more in person in the fall, uh, but we'll see. And yeah. now I wonder how the online classes are gonna be because the expectations, the standard is much higher now for everybody. Mm-hmm. Even, the, the, even the person who is the least tech savvy, their course, I would argue, was probably is is probably much improved compared to where they were before the pandemic. Yeah. And so I think that'll help online education. I think some of the colleges realize that hey, this is we can make money at this while also having it be convenient for people. Right? There's not as much of a stigma because we were forced to do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) oh yeah oh you had an online class and now it's like well everyone's had an online class you know you wouldn't even put that on your resume now you wouldn't put it on your resume that I've talked about because it's just assumed that you better know how to do that now yeah Whereas before you'd put I teach online too you know that's always an Mm add-on and so you're going to be expected to know how to maneuver you're going to be expected to know how to use the learning management system. All that is part of the job now. And I think it would be good, this is just my personal view, but if graduate programs and even undergraduate programs started incorporating that type of teaching, the instructional design stuff into the future teachers of America, whether that's K through 12, because they still use Google Classroom, some use Canvas and other, forms of learning management system, but at the university level too. I'm Mm -hmm. sure there are professors who are posting their grades inside of grade books when they never did that before. Um, And during the pandemic, I, I worked as an instructional designer as well. And that of course allowed me to see what everybody else was doing, right? So here I am, I'm this adjunct professor (laughs) <laughs> kind of going through a little bit of a crisis in his mind is losing his mind a little bit being being locked up um, while also seeing what all these other professors at a private university are doing mm. people who written books and are very well known in other industries because you don't just help the history professors you're helping the tv people the people, the communications people. Oh, wow. All these different biology. And you're starting to see, wow, that was a good idea, even though they didn't know what they were doing. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, because people have these ideas, well, I want to do this. And you're like, oh, oh, that's a wonderful idea. And I know how to do it. So yeah. thank you for the idea. And I know how to build that rocket. <laughs> so we'll both have a rocket, but thanks for the idea, right? And that's what I started to take away from. And I was like, wow, uh, and this works. And people like this and discussion boards in this way can be used to roll over week to week. It doesn't have to be a single discussion every week. And I was like, whoa. And that was a, a, a professor who had written a bunch of really cool movies and TV shows. And he was really nice. He's like, I don't know how to do this. I don't I don't have just one discussion. I have a discussion that lasts multiple weeks. Make me make me make this happen. And 
And we yeah. did it and we worked on it over. The, and I was like, wow, this is great because he would have people watch multiple uh, television shows and then critique certain aspects of stuff, you know. And so you you couldn't be expected to watch six hours of television shows from the 1950s in one week. So it had to be multi-week and things from the previous week connected to the next week. And so the conversation became this robust discussion board. And I went, oh my God, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So you're learning all of these little things and you're helping people and it's, you know, people are on edge because they don't like being online. They want to be in person. The rules always changing. That made a lot of professors kind of cranky as well. And so it was cool for me to be in in kind of the theory area as an instructional designer and then be able to go practice in my own courses. Yeah, what a that actually is like such an amazing blessing to be to see all of the different strategies right there in real time and be the one to help them and then have this opportunity to apply it immediately in your own classes. That's really cool. I didn't know that you were doing that like in the beginning phases of of the pandemic. Yeah, and that that was interesting too because at that time I was adjuncting at I, I adjunct at six different community college campuses. And I had a full-time faculty interview. And I was constantly getting these ideas every single day, talking to people who had been professors 15, 25 years at a really good university with really cool ideas. Mm -hmm. And the history professors not teaching what I teach, but, oh, let's do an annotation. And how do I create an annotation where everybody can participate on a primary source, where mm -hmm. everybody can annotate it? I was like, well, that's a cool idea. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, and or annotating a documentary. And then there's tools for that. So. As I was going through all of these weird experiences, at, before that, I was kind of this major road warrior where I was teaching 9, 10, 11 classes every semester for four years. So I was like destroying, like my skills as a lecturer improved substantially. My ability to speak off the cuff and find moments to be witty all <laughs> were developed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But just by practicing a lot, right? Becoming an expert, going through the volume of it. Yeah. You know, I said, I didn't come from a prestigious university and I don't come from a, 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 a beautiful educational background. I didn't go to a top end university. So how can I differentiate myself from all of these really interesting, smart people who have much better ac academic backgrounds than myself? And I said, well, if you follow the Frederick Douglass model, you better learn how to read a lot. You better learn how to speak and capture people's attention. Mm. And so that's what I really focused on. And I said, the best way for me to do that is not to lecture 15 hours a week, but I'm lecturing 33 hours a week. And that's making me better, even just by if by accident. Yeah. So I was able to do all of that and then have the pandemic hit and ha literally have a team of people because we were an instructional design team saying, have you seen this software? Have you seen that software? Have you done this, that, and the other? So the, by the time I came to my interview, I had a lot accumulated so much knowledge on how to maneuver myself in a way that I think was very marketable and help me stand out against people who do have those educational backgrounds, who, do, who did have those opportunities to go and get their PhD and all of that stuff. So it was really a big, big advantage and a, and a major blessing that I did get to see that. And it's, I think that's one of the sad things about being a professor or a teacher is we don't share what we got enough. We don't share that with one another. So it's like these lost secrets, lost secrets. <laughs> and I got to see what they were doing in their classroom and there was nothing they can do about it because they needed me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So I had a lot of practice, right? A lot of trial and error and making terrible mistakes. 
by te- but uh, but getting those mistakes done faster and yeah. then being able to see what other people do and how other people frame things and look at things and th- that's i mean so for me if i were to create a program to create teachers and i'm not saying i'm the best or the greatest or what i'm just having fun getting paid for it <laughs> <laughs> but if it were up to me, I think teaching people how to create an online ecosystem is important and just doing the job. So if your job is to be a lecturer or to t- teach in front of people, let's uh, those skills, build those, mm-hmm. and brainstorm, build and brainstorm, all constantly working on that. Instead, what a lot of these programs do, and my program included, they teach you how, uh, how to be a historian. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I, I think incorporating some of those elements is going to be very important to the teachers of the future because it'll be expected now. Yeah. You're going to be expected to know how to upload a YouTube video. You're going to be expected to know the software you need to get your videos captioned. And you're going to be expected to make videos or a podcast or any of these other elements. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, and that's what the pandemic really allowed me to realize is that the most important thing is developing the things you need to be successful. And does that mean... Um, does that mean doing things like the way you used to? Well, no, because it makes you realize all the things that are not really necessary to to have a great class or to be effective in your teaching, right? So, yeah, you don't have to just lecture. You can, <laughs> you can. There's a million things you can do, or we don't just have to have a discussion board like me and you have talked about, right? Yeah. <laughs> Make a video. Mm-hmm draw a picture <laughs> i don't know use your talents to create and uh yeah so that's what i'm focusing on moving forward is okay how do we create right yeah i think too um kind of a final thought for our interview is just like before the pandemic <clears throat> historians were really having <clears throat> like a diff sorry my apologies a difficult time adapting in regards to technology so I also think that this was kind of a blessing in disguise for our field in particular because it was like a crash course on on technology we had to figure it out for the sake of our students for our job uh, but it kind of I think it actually really helped our field as well I like I've noted the things The ideas that historians are coming up with now are amazing to me. And that's like, that gets me really excited for these, you know, this next few decades is how are historians in particular going to use those experiences from the pandemic to better our field and for the sake of historical research. Like I'm, I'm really interested to see how that will develop in upcoming years. Yeah. And I'm hoping that a lot of historians are going to start publishing informal media. So instead of getting books or these online journals, oh, that's great, but it's now everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. So they can dig into something and someone across the country can listen. And I don't think that was, that wasn't that popular or that, possible before right so there were like lectures in history there are a couple of history podcasts hardcore history and you know historians knew about it but i think exposing more people to history through informal media substack anything i i mean just having a website yeah people blog you know i think that'll be really helpful for his younger historians coming up because i know when I first got the internet, I was looking up historical facts, battles, this, that, and the other, and that's what got me going. Mm-hmm. And so now with podcasts, YouTube, 
I mean, students are finding stuff and sending it to me two or three semesters later. Did you know there were Confederates in Brazil? <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's cool, you know? That makes yeah. history cool. And I think it it should be cool. Yeah, and I think I think the ones who, the historians who are embracing all of the lessons from in regards to digital you know technology with the pandemic i think i'm going to make a guess here but i, I bet they're probably going to be the ones to take back agency over our fields because prior to the pandemic i felt like in, especially in regards to publications or getting like that coveted tenure position it was so political and to the point where you almost weren't acting like a historian because you were playing the political game so I think maybe an unforeseen kind of outcome of the pandemic is now that these historians are emerging more tech savvy than ever, they're kind of realizing just, you know, they they can self-publish and just how powerful that can be in creating their own content and doing their own independent research. Like, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with with that and who who those historians will be, like who are going to be the ones that emerge and are not letting that fear dictate their actions. Like they're gonna embrace the fear of this unknown chapter in, in our field. So I think I think they're gonna kind of be the ones to take back that agency, uh, kind of push back on that political reality in academia. And, and I'm kind of excited to see how that develops like for, for our careers. Yeah, those things don't matter so much anymore for, you know, most people, who get tenured positions or, or have it uh, where they're kind of go through the pipeline in a, in a perfect trajectory. Mm -hmm. I think allowing kind of the lower, <laughs> the lower rungs of historians to be on the same level is kind of cool. Like I love listening to, I think bringing the classroom to the public yeah. would be great for history you know like Yale's doing it Yale has open Yale that's the first time I heard of David Blight and then I became a huge fan of his bought all, all his books and everything listened to his whole course like if that could happen these people would have these historians these big historians that have really great ideas and content would become more mainstream and that would be great because I don't think we control, we don't control the history of any of it. It's all yeah, script writers and <laughs> all these other people. Well, and even to a degree, I mean, sometimes you might, you could probably argue that really prior to the pandemic, the historians weren't really the ones in charge of history. Like we weren't really in charge of our field there for a minute. And I think that's going to change drastically after the pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Vinny. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule, teaching us more about California history and sharing your, your academic journey. Thank you so much. And you are always welcome here on the podcast. We would love to have you back and yeah. And I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs> Alrighty, take care. <laughs>